All right. Uh, and uh, wait, wait. Здравствуйте. Uh, I, my Russian is terrible, so I was even thinking about saying some jokes in Russian, but I'm not even trying. Um, so uh, that's one of, one of those English sessions that uh, may not be so enjoyable for you due to the language, um, uh, because, uh, as the Russian ones. Um, as I was introduced, my name is Milan Yankov. I work for this company called LifeRay. Anyone heard about LifeRay before? Wow. Okay, half of the room. Interesting. Um, and um, I'm a developer advocate, which means I go to conferences, talk to people like you, and trying to figure out how to make their life easier and better. Um, and I go by Milan Yankov on Twitter. So uh, if you want to argue about anything you hear today or in general, or you just want to tell me how the talk go, uh, how the talk went, um, feel free to uh, just post on Twitter and I'll get back to you. So today, we're going to talk about microservices and modularity. And I'm quite curious, which one of the two words made you come to this talk? Let's say voting for microservices. Who, who is here because of microservices? OK, that's half of the people. And who's here because of modularity? The same people. <laughs> Interesting. And some people are, are not trying to say uh, uh, OK. So. Um, before we do that, though, uh, let me ask you this question. Do you know this operating system called Linux? Anyone familiar with it? Uh, it's, it's a fairly unpopular one. Um, and if you do, you probably know what this does. What, do you, what happens if you type something like this in, in Linux? What it gives you? The ID of the process of, that's Java. So if you have two Java processes running, that's going to give you these two things, right? I mean, there's going to be different numbers, but you get the idea, right? So that's a very simple Linux command, right? Or not? Wait a second. Let's think for a second what this command needs to do. First of all, it needs to know what processes are there in the operating system at all. So then it needs to scan through those processes, figure out which one of them are called Java, then figure out what are their IDEs, and then get only those IDEs and give it back to you. So it's not that simple after all. At the end of the day, this is what it does. You agree? Well, agree or not, the result is pretty much the same. I just didn't bother to make it so that it prints on the same line. So having these two examples in place, how do you think? What's the difference between them? I'll tell you what it is. Last one is the monolith, and the other one is the microservices. Right? So if you are about microservices, don't you ever type PID off. It's a monolith. It's a bad thing. You don't do these things in production. Right? Just kidding. All right. There is a reason, both for this thing to exist. And uh, hopefully, I'll convince you that there is a reason in general for, for monoliths to exist. But first, what are microservices? Who is willing to give an answer? Who knows what are microservices? OK, don't give an answer. Raise your hand if you know what microservices is. Two people. Oh, no, more people. Good. Good for you, because I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I've been trying to figure out, it's been what, like three, four years since microservices are the hype? I've been trying to figure out a definition of microservices, and there's no one that I can actually like. The best thing that comes to my mind is this article from Martin Fowler and James Lewis, uh, which specifies the characteristics of microservices. So it's not a definition. It's basically telling you, if you do microservices, chances are you're doing those things. OK? Um, and it's, it's, it's fair. It's a very fair and very good article, in my opinion. Um, so we have things like componentization via services, business capabilities, uh, dump pipes and uh, smart endpoints, and all those things, which makes sense. Now, if you look into that really careful, though, what you will realize is that half of those are not strictly related to the process of developing software. They're obviously related to the whole culture, the company infrastructure, and how we organize teams and all those things. They're like also related, but not per se something that tells you how to build software. Some of those are more about, about how you organize your teams than how you build your projects. 
So, a very important question that you want to ask yourself is, and, and probably you already got the answer because it's been a while since microservices are the trend, but let's go back to the beginning. Let's just imagine it's just showed up, everyone's talking about it, so why? Why consider microservices? So, I did some time ago, that may have changed since then, but I did some time ago a search on the internet about what people say about microservices and why uh, they use, and you can see the highlighted text, you don't have to read it, you can just trust me. Most of the people in one form or another say that, well, they use microservices because it reduces complexity, right? Sounds reasonable, you agree with that? No, yes, yes, no, oh, okay. Oh, let's see how your micro, let's assume that these people are right and how we reduce complexity by microservices. So those are your microservices. I don't care which language you use to write them, even though this presentation is going to focus on Java, but you can write microservices in any language that you wish. And now that you have them, you have to run them. So you pick a technology to run them. That's going to be probably um, on uh, Jetty or Undertow or Tomcat, or if, if you're in a Java world, obviously. Or Spring Boot. Hey, who is using Spring Boot? Oh, man. Still in the hype, right? OK. Or uh, anyone using Drop Wizard? And that's what I thought. Um, OK, so you pick one of those technologies to run your microservices and eventually to build them. And you're all good to go, right? Oh no, wait a minute, you have to deploy them somewhere. So before you do that, you have to package them, ideally in uh, Docker containers. Anyone not using Docker containers? Oh, a few people, that's interesting. Or you do virtual machines or whatever is your kind of favorite thing, and then you put them in some thing like VMware or uh, VirtualBox or whatever. Now, you may think, oh wait, that's not what we do. We just click a button, and things happen, and that's because you use the cloud. Anyone not using the cloud? Oh, that's what I thought. OK, so you have the cloud thing. It's either Amazon or Google or I don't care. It's, a, it's very easy. Click a button, get a machine, get the things running, right? So on the top of that, you realize that now that you have all those microservices, they actually need to somehow talk to each other. Right? And so this is where all kinds of messages and protocols and things like Kafka or Kubernetes for simply managing the Docker containers um, or, I don't know, Fabricate or a bunch of Netflix projects out there, those are the things that all of a sudden come in place. But that's okay because we're developers and we can deal with those things. Well, no, we're not developers, we're DevOps now. Okay? So once we figure that out, we realize that there is actually uh, some hassles with like deployment or collecting logs from all those services. So this is where we think uh, we enter the world of Chief, Puppet, Console, uh, Elasticsearch, Kibana, you name it. It's probably, I don't know, thousands of those. But that's okay, because those are cool technologies and we love it, right? And once we've done all this, we've just reduced the complexity of our app. That's so simple now. You know, the stupid monolith is, is gone, and it's now easy peasy, right? Happy about it, easy, okay. Okay, back to that article that I showed you earlier. And uh, a lot of people were, I don't see that referred any, uh, too much these days, but before people were referring to that article without noticing that particular one sentence, uh, which I think is the whole clue of that thing, is if you do this, Essentially, what you're doing is you're shifting complexity from one place to another. And not only that, you're shifting it to a place which is much harder to control. Now, let me ask you, each of developers, right, I assume, all of you, when were the last time that you had to deal with the details of an IP protocol or TCP IP protocols or all those things? Well, guess what? If you move to the distributed world, you will have to. Unless, of course, your DevOps colleague next to you is going to do it for you. So you're shifting the complexity from one place to another. So then the question that arises, OK, when, wait a minute. If, if it is more complex, then what is so cool about microservices? Why people are so excited about it? Those are some quotes that I found that describe uh, uh, why microservices are cool. Because they're the real power. Um, they allow you to build 
tiny little components uh, and then deploy them multiple times. They're highly scalable, robust. Um, uh, they're very, uh, what is it else? Um, uh, that's the only thing to do distributed environment. Do you agree with those? Anyone who disagree? No, you agree, right? I agree as well. Yep, believe it or not, you can check the URLs. Those are the exact words that several years ago people used to talk about EJB, particularly in 99, 2002. And 10 years from now, you will be using, or some of our, or some other people will be using the exact those words to describe yet another technology that's going to be the newest and coolest kids on the block 10 years from now. That's called marketing. So don't believe this. So there's an article by Gartner, which you can't find anymore, but luckily there's a Wayback Machine uh, that allows you to search some uh, this stuff that disappeared from the internet. And in this article, back from 2001, Gartner claimed that companies worldwide have spent over a billion dollars on technologies that they don't need. Because vendors were trying to tell them that the only way to build these types of application is to use this technology, and they believe them. Uh, yeah, wait, that's not happening today, right? Um, so, let's take a different perspective. Who's doing microservices? I mean, a part of you, because all of you are doing, obviously, right? So, let's talk about these companies. I mean, this list you can mix and match. You can throw away those guys and put a bunch of others that are more relevant than Russia, probably. Uh, but it doesn't matter. Whatever you put in that list, it's going to come down to the question, what do they have in common? What do you think they have in common? I mean, okay, they are large companies, they build large software, that's fine. But other than that, they have a lot of money, that's true. Uh, sorry? Subscription-based business. That's very close to what I want to tell you. They build microservices to support their own subscription-based business. It's not a software what they sell. They sell something else. They use the software for themselves. So if you think of it, they have a significant benefits because they are not constrained by the constraints of a typical software company. What that means is they can shift their technologies. They can build a team that best represents their one business case scenario. They can, do, they can implement DevOps. Uh, they can do all kinds of things that best match their business model. That is not something that you can always do. Now, imagine you're a software vendor, and you build a product. And you go to a customer and say, guess what? We have this product. It's cool. It's great. It's going to solve all your problems. Except you have to change your business model, right? You have to fire all teams and hire these other guys and then introduce DevOps and then do all these other things. Um, I think they're going to show you the door pretty soon, right? So this is not something that is universally true. And one thing to remember is a technique that is available for a highly advanced team, it's not necessarily available or useful or successful for any other team, right? So it's not because Google does this, it does not mean that if you do the same, you're going to be the next Google, which is a lot of people tend to forget. So the question is, should you use microservices? And that's kind of an old question because you probably already answered it. And my answer to that is, think about yourself. Would you put your company name in that space? If so, then probably you should. Maybe it makes sense for you. Anyways, though, you should think about why are you doing this thing? And the why question is the most important. What problem are you trying to solve by introducing this type of architecture or different type of architecture? OK, so when we speak about architecture, um, a lot of people speak about microservices architecture and that how they do microservices architecture. And they ignore this advice from a guy, the same people that tell you that, wait, well, actually, you should start with the monolith and keep it modular. And only when the time comes, split it into microservices. Why is that? And if, if, if not, what else? The reason for this talk was to tell people that this is 
the wrong assumption. Microservices is not going to cure anything. They're not going to cure your complexity. And the reason Microsoft's, uh, microservices is not going to cure your complexity is because nothing cures complexity. The complexity comes from the domain that you operate in. If you're building a bank software, the banking domain is not going to get any simpler just because you introduce microservices. And this is largely where your complexity comes from. Obviously, if you do a bad design in your application, you can add additional complexity. But that's the thing that you shouldn't do anyway, doing microservices or not. Okay? So what you can do then is you can think, so now that you know that there is no cure, so there, there are diseases that, are, that, that, that you don't have a cure for them, but you have a treatment for them, right? So you know this is not going to get any less complex, but you need to figure out how to deal with that complexity, how to make it easier for you to manage it, okay? And that's the treatment part. So you acknowledge the problem is not going to go away, or you're solving the wrong problem, and now you're focusing on solving the right problem. So I would say the treatment is the exact same treatment that has always been in software, which is a clean architecture, clean modular architecture in this particular case. So if you build clean, well-designed, well-structured application, you can deal with any kind of, com of complexity. And microservices are kind of a side effect. In fact, the guy named Uncle Bob claims that there is no such thing as microservices architecture. Because microservices architecture is essentially a deployment option. That's what you do when the time comes to go live to place your stuff somewhere. It has nothing to do with how you design your application. So if you properly design your application, when the time comes, you get the, and, and you have all the data, you may decide that microservices is the way to go for deployment. But that should not be absolutely a number one decision about uh, when you start thinking about the architecture of your application. Okay. So, I've seen, uh, before doing this talk, I've, I've said this like, I don't know how many times to how many people, and the answer that I get always is this. Wait, it's nice, it's theory, but you know, we have so complex applications, and for us, this is never going to work. So, I said, I'm going to do a demo. I'm going to actually demonstrate this, and I'm going to use a third-party code. It's, I'm not going to build microservices or anything in the architecture from scratch. I'm just going to grab someone else's code, which I don't know, and, 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 and demonstrate what I mean by this talk. Um, this URL is the uh, URL to the source code. If you want to play with that later on by yourself, feel free to do so. I will go through the code examples fairly quick, so we can fit in time. I hopefully just give you the overview idea, but obviously feel free to play with it and let me know what you think. So, are you familiar with this application? Anyone? Oh, two people, and you're all Java developers. Great. I guess you're not an enterprise Java developers, right? Okay, so this is the Java EE 6 tutorial, which uses an application called, uh, how it is called? Uh, I keep forgetting the name. Duke's Forest. This is how it looks like. And it teaches you how to do Java EE um, in a best possible way. And as you can see, they even, that's a nice diagram here, and they can even tell you that it's modular, so that's great. So let's quick go through that application. This is, by the way, running on uh, Glassfish uh, with GS, uh, sorry, JSF and every single technology that you can imagine from Java EE spec. So you have the home page. You can list some products, hopefully. Uh, you can log in. Um, you have some administration here. You can administer the user, so that doesn't work. Maybe, what is it, uh, products is going to work. Yeah, whatever. Unfortunately, they don't have any kind of tests. I mean, come on, who's writing, who's writing tests in Java, right? I mean, no one cares. Um, so there's no way to actually um, uh, do some kind of integration test or, or unit test or whatever. But basically, you see it works. Now, we have this thing called product catalog in here. 
uh, M, I, one, to grab that thing, that part only, that product catalog, and use it in a different application, right? So, as a good developer, what I do, I look in the source code. I look in the source code, start searching for the thing. So, uh, this, let's first compile this thing again. To make sure it works. Okay, you can read the screen. I hope you can. Uh, I mean, in a sense of a font size, not in a sense of every single message. Okay, so it builds. It has some modules. Nice. Okay, let's make sure it still works. Yep, it works. Yeah, yeah. it's a redeployment thing on WebLogic. Don't worry. Uh, not on no, Glassfish. Sorry. Uh, anyway, so now let's look inside the code. So when I look for things like this, I usually use a tool called JDepend. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. If you're following Java 9 trends, there is a similar tool calling in, uh, coming in Java 9 called JDeps. This is a JDepend. It's the same thing. Uh, sorry, it's in the where it is into the stats folder. JDepends report. Here we go. And it builds me a nice little diagram that tells me what's where. Okay? And now I'm looking for my catalog, catalog thing. That's the thing that I want to get and, and just use it somewhere else. And what do I see? EJB, web, events, util, sh oh, shipment. Oh, there is a business kind of thing. Entity. None of this tells me anything about business functionality of that application. It all tells me everything about how my application is structured in terms of Java objects, in terms of Java technologies. And that's great because that's all what we all developers love. And no one else understands that diagram from a business perspective. So let's try to fix that. OK, so this goes the demo. Now I have this little tiny demo script here. Which basically does the same. The, it goes through the git, get bunch of comments, and shows you the diffs. This is how it goes. So there are four comments in here. Don't have to read it. What I do here is I move the domain model into a separate module. I extract a generic model from the thing that they have as the entities. Uh, then I need to change all the references over the code to reflect the new structure uh, and rename some entity classes. Let's see how, in general, that works. So this is basically the change. This is my new module here. It's called Duke Domain Model. And if you look inside it, it basically has POJOs. Now, you can argue if those are going to be POJOs or do I need the getters and setters, forget about it, do it the way you wish. It could be public uh, uh, fields in here if you wish. Uh, it doesn't really matter. The main thing is this thing is clearly plain Java object that is, is a model. Uh, it does not depend on anything else. The reason I change it is because this is how it looks like originally, if you look at the person thing. Well, this is the model. Anything that bothers you in that class? Because uh, I think someone made an assumption that our model is tightly coupled with the JPA that we are using. And I don't really want to be that way, so I decided to change that. So that's my main motivation here. I'm just making some objects clean, and, and then I have here entities just to be persistent with the uh, original application. So I do have my product entity, which extends products, and then adds all this crap in here. So now instead of having one place, I have two places. I have the domain model and something that is tied to JPA. That's pretty much what I did in this comment. OK, let's go one step further. Now, I'm going to now define some use cases. Let's see how that works. Uh, so I basically defined use case called catalog. Sorry for the font size. I can't make this one bigger. Uh, E-commerce and identity. And let's look at the, the, uh, um, the, the, to the catalog thing, because that's what I'm interested in. I have this thing called product manager. I know it's a poor name. I should have been better in, in, in making up names, but that's just a demo. So this thing is an interface. And that interface has a bunch of, of, of methods, and abstract methods, obviously, as they are in the, inside the interface. And what do they tell me? 
they tell me that whoever is going to be a product manager can or must be able to do those things. So that is my use case. I'm basically defining my use case in an interface. I'm saying, if you are a product manager, I don't care how you're implemented. If you're a product manager, you need to be able to give me a product, or to update a product, or to delete a product. Those are your responsibilities. I don't care how you do it, but those are your responsibilities. In other words, this is a contract between me and whoever claims to be the product manager. Okay? So, I also use this thing here called, uh, where it is, wait a second, the, uh, the product persistence kind of thing, which is the contract between me and the storage where I'm going to store these products. I don't care if that's going to be database, flat file, you know, MongoDB, whatever. As soon as you want to store things, those are the things you want to do. Um, if you don't do them, I don't care, I don't talk to you, that's my contract. Okay. And I have the similar contracts for all the other things, like e-commerce and, um, and what is it, the identity and, and those things. So basically, I'm just introducing three new things in here. Nothing special. OK, so now that we have those, we have to refactor the rest of the application to actually use them. So how that works, uh, wait a second, wrong thing, OK. So now. Uh, we get rid of, we move all this like gig store and, um, uh, and entities uh, into this thing called JPA persistence. Uh, and now this is my persistence layer that implements the contracts that I've just defined. So now I'm basically saying this thing is can store things into a persistent into a database and it does implement, let's say that's my product. Product, uh, where it is, product persistence JPA, and it is product persistence. It implements my contract. So I don't care how it stores things. It's, it's out of scope for me, uh, as long as it does, and it does it according to the contract that we've signed. Okay, so that's what I did here. I just implemented a persistence in this comment. One more thing. Now we need to deal with the front end part of it, all the Java server pages and um, uh, just server faces and all these other crazy things. So that's a, lot, uh, a little bit more different, uh, a little bit more code in here, but it's no different. It's just refactoring the code to use the new concept of use cases instead of using what was there before. So if you look into, for example, how was this uh, product controller uh, defined before. So that's the original class. And as you can see, it's either it's a controller, but then again, you have kind of logic in it. Um, and uh, okay, no, sorry, that's the wrong class. Um, the controller is still the same. Product bean, I think, is the one that was different. Okay, so the product bean. It's a bean, but it still has a persistence logic in it. That was the original code. Whereas, if you look at my version of it now, that's it. That's the whole class. All you see on the screen is the whole class. It basically, the only thing that does is links my uh, uh, front end or the consumer part with the particular implementation of the contract. That, that's all it does. It just finds an implementation and says, OK, you want to do these things? This is the guy who can do it according to the contract. And the rest of the changes are just basically uh, adapting classes so they can uh, use the new, the new approach. Final touches, I needed to change a little bit the way we generate the diagram and reorganize things into a nice modules and things like that. Let me quick, sh quickly show you that. Again, you can look at the source code yourself and go change by change and figure out why the world goes that way. So all these Duke payments, Duke resources, Duke shipment, Duke store, they're gone. Events, they are all now in this thing called J2E apps, and that's my front end. I don't care about that. That's JSF, that's all the, the cool front end stuff. It's not part of my logic. Okay, and now I just changed the JPA persistence to go in different module, no class changes, just shifting classes around. Um, and obviously, I needed to change the, the POM uh, to add the new modules. Okay, that's pretty much it. Let's build it now. <clears throat> Uh, Maven, clean, install. And it's going to take a second to build. And what you will realize is that 
And we now have a few more modules in there. Uh, so as you can see, we have the, um, uh, what we do have here, the catalog management use cases, the user identity use cases, and so forth. All right, so we build that. Let's make sure it works. Let's go back to my application here and reload it. How do you do that in Firefox? Here we go. Uh, hey, home, probably, hey, it works. Nothing changed, it's the same application, it just uses a different structure. Let's see if I can log in. Uh, I need to provide a username first. I can still log in. So, let's assume that I didn't break anything and I just changed the source code of my application and it still works. Well, let's see how we change the source code of that application. Let's use the JDPen tool again. And this is what it generates now. So, what do I have here? I have use cases there, catalog, e-commerce, and identity. And I have a JPA persistence in here, which uh, may be JPA, maybe something else. And then I have this thing called wiring. And if you, you look at the arrows, the persistence knows about the use case, but use case doesn't know anything about persistence. How they work together? Because of the wiring. The wiring is the thing that tells them, you guys need to work together to get the job done, right? And then that's my front end over there, uh, shipment UI, whatever, okay? So I now refactored my application in a way that answering the question, which part do I need to run a independent catalog service is straightforward to answer. That's that guy there. It's the use case catalog. That's all I need, plus obviously the API, which is hidden on this picture. Those are the two things that I need to run an independent version of the product catalog. And let me demonstrate that to you by creating a what? Microservice. Okay, what I'm gonna use for microservice, anyone willing to guess? Come on, say it. Spring Boot, that's it. All right. Those of you familiar with Spring Boot applications will be fairly, uh, no wait, I'm getting lost here. Uh, familiar with what's going on here. That's my Spring application, that's straightforward. And I have this REST interfaces in here. Let me, have just, let me just show you the product manager in this case. That's my product manager. What does it do? It, it, it just extends the abstract class that I created to make it easier and wires it with the persistence. That's what it does. This is my wiring layer. It basically says, you want to use persistence? That's the guy. How did I implement the persistence? It's very straightforward. Uh, catalog storage, uh, it's just a memory hash map. That's a demo, so I don't care. I'm just gonna store things in memory for now. Okay, that's it. Let's build this thing. Oh, by the way, I'm going to stop Glassfish now. Uh, okay, and... Uh, I'm going to start something else, which I'm going to need later on. Okay, forget about that. Okay, so let's build this thing. And now that I don't have uh, Glassfish running, I cannot use install anymore. Uh, don't ask me why, ask Sun or Oracle. Um, but I'm just gonna do a clean package now, just to build the whole thing again. And what you will see in here is that we now have this thing called catalog microservice. So let's start that. Ouch, not the wrong, wrong thing. Do you have undo? Yes, please, thank you. Uh, duplicate is what I wanted to do. Uh, catalog microservice target. Java jar catalog, catalog microservice jar. My Spring Boot app is starting on, um, I also used a uh, like a REST front end in here uh, which uses things called JSON doc. So to demonstrate this thing is working, I'm gonna go here, get the documentation. Okay, this is my RESTful services uh, in Spring, written in Spring Boot from the exact same code that we had in the Glassfish. Here is a product. I can get the list of all products. 
uh, which is empty. I can add a product, uh, just say five, and test, and submit, and then I can get again all products, please, uh, uh, products, submit, and I have. So I now created a RESTful service out of the, um, out of the, um, the code that I had. Okay, what else I can do? Let's go back here. Let me first convert all my modules into OSGI bundles. How do I do that? Well, I'm just going to add a Maven plugin in them, basically telling them that uh, this is uh, going to be a bundle. That's it. Um, so I convert them to bundles. And then I'm going to do another thing. I'm going to do, I'm going to create a noise GI service, and I'm going to create a noise GI shell command. Let me show you those real quick. Uh, so I'm just creating new projects here, totally new projects. So this is how my product service looks like. Uh, it's, again, the same concept, using different technology. Now I'm using Goiz GI Declarative Services in here, but basically you could use Blueprint or whatever else, and you basically say, I'm wiring these two things together. This is something that does product management, and this is something that persists things. Okay, and it's, again, the same stupid uh, in-memory uh, hash map persistence. Um, and I also have this thing called product command. Now, that's the OSGI-specific thing, because OSGI gives you a nice shell, and you can actually build commands that you can execute from the shell. So I'm not going to bother you with this code, but you will see it in action in a second. All right, so let's build that again. It should have two more uh, things in there. That's the, uh, the uh, well, actually a couple of more things, a few OSGI modules. The, the OSGI services, the OSGI catalog service provider, the commands. In OSGI, that's a nice thing that you create bundles for, for the things that you need. All right, let's now duplicate and go to Felix. Felix is the one of the implementation of OSGI runtime. Uh, and I'm going to first make sure I'm, I'm going to clean the cache. Uh, uh, don't ask me why. And then I'm going to run Felix. All right. So that's what I have. I have a runtime, an OSGI runtime. And inside, I have OSGI catalog service provider, catalog commands, things like that. This also runs. Um, Ah, wait, I forgot one, one, one thing, and uh, that's why I have so few bundles in here. Wait a second. Um, why I have one more comment to go. And that is the REST interface, because without it, I cannot show you anything. So how do you do RESTful services in OSGI? It's probably very complicated, right? I mean, OSGI is very complicated, so it should be very complicated. Ignore the lib folder for a while. This is my REST service. It's a standard JAX-RS REST service. And the only thing OSGI specific in that is this add component annotation, which wires it to my product, uh, which defines it as a component, and this add reference annotation that wires it to my product thing. OK, and that's it. I just created a standard JAX-RS web service. OK, so now I have to build it again. And probably should get rid of the clean keywords just because make, to make things faster, but it's okay. It's, it's I guess fast enough. Okay, so now I can run my uh, Felix, and uh, okay, now you see I have a few more things. All of a sudden, I have like things like Jetty and Appy and Servlet and all kinds of things. Okay, let's make sure this thing works. So let's go to this is uses another. Um, another uh, front-end thing, uh, which is, uh, I can forget the name, you probably recognize it, uh, Swagger? Was it that? Uh, never mind. Anyway, I have the product thing, and I have get product and get product by ID. Let's get a product. Okay, it's empty. I have no products. But I didn't design, my REST service only has gets. I cannot add a product. So how can I add a product? Well, that's where my command comes into. I just created a command which I can call on the command line. And I can say product add test test one, two, three. And I just added the product. You don't believe me? Let's try that. It's there. 
So now I have two user interfaces that are using the exact same service that's installed inside the OSGI environment. And now I know what you're thinking. You're like, oh, well, but you're comparing Spring Boot, which is tiny little microservices design framework, with the huge OSGI thing that no one wants to use. Interesting. Let's see. Let's, let's verify that statement. So um, I'm not going to bother you with file size, because that's irrelevant. But I'm going to run this too, called JVisual VM. I'm just going to look what's inside. How do you think they compare? Let's look at that. OK, so this is my catalog microservice jar. That's my Spring a boot application. Let's go to monitor. So this goes uh, oh, surprisingly well during this time. Goes about 70, whatever, 67 uh, heap, and over 5,500 uh, classes, uh, I believe it does. OK, let's try to see the Felix jar which is the OSJ environment. Uh, how do you think it does? Well, it goes at 15 whatever, 15 megs of RAM, and uses uh, a little over 3,000 classes. That's so far for your tiny little Spring Boot architecture and the huge and complex OSJ environment. And guess what? Spring Boot, you can only do one thing, the thing that you just run. You cannot change it. And in here, I have a dynamic environment where I can, things change on, I can change things on the fly as they see fit and use less resources than Spring Boot. OK. Um, so I'm going to stop these guys. We don't need them anymore. I think I made my point. Um, and one final thing, what else we can do is we can create a scary word, portlet. How many of you have done portlets in their lives? Okay, you said you know life so I guess some of you have. Okay, so portlets are like no-go these days because it's like, oh my god, that's like, this is e crazy stuff. Okay, let's, if you have the right tool in place, this is what it takes to make a portlet. And um, this works on uh, latest LifeRay 7. So that's my whole portlet project. It's one class. It's a catalog portlet, and it uses the OSGI add component annotation to basically register as an OSGI service, provide a bunch of properties, and it also uses add reference annotation to wire me with that product catalog thing. Now, there are two important things in the, uh, different than the wiring we had before, which is this thing here, reference policy called dynamic and reference cardinality called optional. What does that mean, what, th what this means is basically telling the OSGI environment, uh, you know what, just let me know if that thing comes and goes, and I'll handle it. I can work with or without it. And you'll see that, that in a second. OK, so uh, this is my life right here somewhere running. Uh, let me log in. Uh, OK. Here we go. I'm going to create a simple page. Uh, call it catalog. Uh, let it be a single column. Add the page. And in here, I want to add my catalog application. Oops, I don't have a catalog application. Obviously, I don't because I didn't build the thing. So let's build it again. And, um, OK, it should now give me a, uh, a catalog portlet. Nice. All right, let's reload this so the, the, the application refreshes and catalog. Uh, where it is? OK, I probably should give it some time to. That is seven, but that's a milestone edition, so don't get confused about the user interface. Uh, that's just the, the last milestone before we change the UI. <laughs> uh, so, Duke's catalog, here it is. And, and the reason I'm using this is because I never had the time to actually make it work with the, uh, with the latest life ray. And because of the demo script, it, it requires a lot more work than just replacing the life ray. Okay, so my Duke's catalog is empty. Uh, and I have no options of adding products to it, except I can do it on the command line, except with LifeRay, I don't have any command line. All right, that's not really true. Uh, we actually do have a command line. 
which I can do with, uh, wait a second, let me make this bigger for you. Uh, so I can tone that straight into my life ray, and I have the exact same OSG environment which I had with, uh, with Felix, and in here, I can say product add test, test, whatever, and I can reload this page, and here's my product. All right, so again, I'm just using this one service that does its thing, and I'm accessing it in two different ways. And now I know what you're thinking. Okay, we're talking about microservices, we're talking about distributed, we're talking about cloud, and all these great things, and all you're telling us is about single JVM, and how in the world that has something to do with microservices. So, remember the second part of the talk is modularity. All I'm talking so far is modularity. I didn't say it has to be distributed, but it can be distributed. So let's make it distributed if we want to um, uh, so much. Okay, uh, where's my build again? Final comment. All I need to do, now that I have this infrastructure in place, is this. And I use OSGI now, so I can benefit from it. As, uh, ignore the lips again. That's, that's a bug fix for uh, uh, JSON serializer. Ignore that. That's the only change you need to do. You need to say to the environment that you're using remote services. Okay? And that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. Let's build it. And, oh, before I did that, uh, okay, never mind. Um, I hope it's going to work because I screwed up something. What I wanted to also show you is uh, so remember, this is my life ray. I have my product here. So, and if I reload, it should work now. It should be empty because I just uh, reloaded the whole thing. So the product's not there. Remember, in memory persistence. So what I want to do now is uh, where I am. Okay, I'm going to create a new show here. Um, I'm just going to make sure it's I'm, I'm in the right folder. Uh, so I'm going to go to my life ray. Uh, where am I? Uh, projects, life ray, demos, events, modularity, come on, M4, uh, OSGI, modules, and I'm going to just delete the jar file. How many of you are okay with deleting a jar file in production? I'm okay with that. I'm just going to delete it. All right. Let's go back to my life. I just deleted the jar file from my production environment. What do you think is going to happen? Nothing. That's because what I told. I can deal with the thing whether it is there or not. If it's not there, just let me know. I'll handle it. In this case, I handle it by displaying a, a message to the people to say, well, sorry, I can't do that for you at that very moment. Try later. Okay, now that we have the distributed stuff in place, um, let's go and to go, where was my Felix? Uh, okay, here is my Felix framework. Let's clean the cache again, just to make sure things are not stale, and run Felix. Now I'm running totally different environment. Uh, on the same machine, but I could easily do that on a very different machine. So I'm just gonna make sure my Felix is running. Yes, it is running. Okay, let me reload that page. Oh, look, I have my catalog service again. That works. Okay, let me now go to my tel where I did Telnet into LifeRay. And remember, LifeRay doesn't have the service. I deleted it from there. But I can still do product add test whatever and reload this. Hey, here is my thing. But let me this time not do this in life ray, but go to, this is my Felix, and do the same thing in Felix. Product add test from Felix. Okay, I just added it in a different environment. to dumb. Okay, distribute it. Happy? Yeah. All right. So, that's it for the demo. Let's go back to this. What did we just do? We started with this, which is we had an application. Remember, third-party application, it's not something that I designed and I understand how it works. 
And it has this JPA and EJB, and it has modules, but those modules were useless. How did we change it? We changed it into that. And now it's so scary. It's so much more work, it's so much more code, um, and so much more modules. But let's look into how it works. In our, so we have in the middle the domain model, that's what everyone uses. Then we have these use cases that I designed, God knows why. Uh, and then we have things like JPA persistence or in memory persistence or JSF or portal and things like that in some other circle. And then we have different runtime environments, OSGI, Wi-Fi, databases, Spring Boot, and so forth. Why? Because we wanted to model the existing application, and in the existing applications, we, we, to build it in the exact same way, that's what we did. We used the domain model, the three use cases, JPA persistence, JSF to display things, EGB controllers to wire things together, and we used the GE container to run the whole thing in. And obviously, we used the database. Then we decided that we're going to build a microservices, and that's what we needed. Keep in mind, the domain model and the catalog use case, they never change. Those are the exact same jar files. Okay? The only thing we did was in memory persistence and Spring Boot, and we wired it together and run it, and our service was up and running. So we then changed it to become a OSGI services, and now still, we still use the same domain model, the same use case catalog, um, the same in memory persistence, well, different, but same uh, uh, concept. They would just happen to wire things as an OSGI services and run them inside an OSGI environment. And finally, we use the exact same thing, except we changed the display option. So now instead of having a RESTful service, we have a portlet that displays them nice on table on the page. Domain model, catalog use case, we never touched them in that process. Those were the exact same two jar files that we had in the original, after refactoring, obviously, uh, Glassfish application. That is modularity. It's not putting stuff into a different folder, giving it a name, and calling it a module. It's encapsulation and coherence and thinking about how things work together. And I wish I was able to now tell you that I'm so smart that I invented this, but it's been around for ages. It's known as clean architecture. Uncle Bob's bitching about it for I don't know how many years. You've seen different versions of it called layered architecture, um, what is it, adapters and ports, uh, and so forth. Simon Brown has a bunch of nice talks about his like, uh, version of, of that very same thing. It is a application architecture. If you design your application properly, it doesn't matter how you deploy it. It doesn't matter if it's a monolith or microservices or whatever else, and the microservices becomes a deployment option. So the key point from that talk is modularity is what you aim for, and not modularity by just putting stuff in a folder and giving it a name, but modularity in the full sense of that word. Once you have this, you're good to go. You don't need microservices to do modularity. I'm going to rush through a couple of uh, company-related sites so just to let you know that this is not a toy. That's what we do at LifeRay. And these guys are also using OSGI uh, uh, for, uh, for the exact same reason. Not because you can hot swap jar files at runtime, but because of the modularity aspects of it, but because it gives you the nice concept of isolation and coherence. And the responsibility and contracts, okay? And why? Because if you think about all those specs that Martin Fowler and James Lewis defined, you have them all inside the OSGI framework by contract. Component, components, services, smart endpoints, dump pipes, all those things been there for ages. Uh, and so that's what we have. We have one platform. We can deliver it as a single piece. It has over 100 apps. It has over 600 modules. And it has over 2,500 microservices inside of it. And it can run as a single piece in this machine, or it can run distributed if we want it to. Now, the difference is, if I, if, if I have an architecture like this that I can run on my single laptop, I can test it on my laptop. If my architecture only works in Amazon Cloud with 355 nodes, there's no way for me to test that, right? 
That's it from me for today. Thank you. <clears throat> we have several minutes for questions, guys. Well, I think you expect this question, Java 9 modules. I do. I always get that question, and I never answer to it. <laughs> and um, yeah, so uh, as I said, the, uh, Jigsaw, uh, or what we should probably use it from uh, now on, JPMS, which stands for Java Platform Modular System, is solving different type of problem. And it, it started as an attempt to modularize the uh, JDK itself. Um, uh, and uh, as such, is doing great job. It is uh, out of question, but it doesn't give you any of this. I mean, it is. It, it does give you. It does give you some cohesion and some some things, but it doesn't give you any dynamism. It, it doesn't give you versions, uh, and and it's static. Uh, and it, 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 it's. I don't think it's going to be some, uh, and, and it also breaks a lot of things. It breaks backward compatibility. So, for example, if you want to use OSGI, you can use OSGI with Java 1.4, and that's no problem with that. You know, to migrate your applications to Java, anyone try to migrate their applications to Java 9 in this room? No, okay, um, that's what I expect. Um, uh, people have tried to see enormous pain because of all the, all the restrictions that, that, that they have. And also, you, I don't have the time to go in details, but it's a fundamentally different concept. In, in, strict, in strict modular systems, you operate on visibility. That thing, if it's not available to you, you don't know it exists. It's totally hidden, and that's how OSGI operates. And JPMS operates on permissions. So you can still see everything. You can still have one huge image of the whole JVM, but when you try to access a class, it's going to tell you, no, 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 you don't have the permission to touch it. Right? So it's a, fundament it's a conceptually different model. I'm not saying it's bad. It is, my personal opinion is, for the purpose it started as a project, which is modularized the JDK, they did awesome work. What is wrong with it is Oracle trying to push it as a general purpose modular framework, which wasn't designed. It was designed taking into account all the constraints of the JDK. And that's what makes it not well suited for a general purpose modular framework. Yeah. All right. I'm uh, very thank you, uh, thank you for this. Uh, um, don't know how to say. Um, Presentation. I'm, I'm totally agree with your points, and I I would but. like to uh, comment one of your statements. Uh, a statement about that the OSGI is quite a hard stuff which nobody wants to deal with. Uh, in fact, I never understand that. We have uh, several projects designed on OSGI, mm -hmm. and I never understood why everything th th thinks that OSGI is a difficult stuff. I can answer uh, that. And uh, I always catch myself on a mind that today industry is, in fact, heading us away from uh, modularity you are describing. You are saying that we always can package our modules uh, in some, uh, I would say, general way, and uh, in such ways that uh, gives us an option to deploy it in different ways. We can mm -hmm. deploy it in uh, OSGI container, we can deploy it on cloud as microservices, we can deploy it in Java EE container. Right. But uh, I always catch myself on, my, uh, on mind that in practice it's not so easy. For example, if you take Spring, everyone loves Spring. Right? No, I'll argue with that statement. But, uh, but <laughs> Spring, starting from version 4, abandoned support of OSGI. And okay, so the, this, the Spring and OSGI story is it's far, far longer than, than that. Uh, and currently, uh, Spring can be used in OSGI only because there are some service mix guys who did the repackaging yep. stuff. So, okay, we took Spring, so, but we tie our code on Spring. And it reduces our options uh, on on packaging and, and, and on deploying the stuff. Uh, okay, I get your point, but uh, would you ask a the question? Because I now don't know which question I need to answer. Okay, uh, I agree with my main statement, which I uh, want to describe. That today industry is 
hitting us away from the modularity. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, yes and no. I mean, I do agree. I know a lot of people doing modularity. I know a lot of people doing OSGI. Now, back to your uh, why people perceive OSGI as a complex and, 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 and scary thing. They will do the same thing with Java 9 very soon. As a matter of fact, there was a recent tweet a couple of, I don't know, days, weeks ago, uh, where someone asked Mark, Mark Reinhold, what's your main concern? And Mark answered that people will try uh, JPMS with their broken modules, and then they're going to blame the, J, uh, the JPMS for it. And I replied that, well, be prepared, because that is indeed what's going to happen. And that is indeed what happened to OSGI. Um, uh, OSGI was there to solve a problem. People tried to use it as a general purpose framework for anything. Didn't work. They blamed the framework. That's the same thing that's going to happen to Java 9. It is there to solve a particular problem. People are going to use it as a general purpose solution for everything. It's not going to work. They're going to blame it. Uh, so that's how we operate. The main point for me is, the, the, the main takeaway, the, the main difference is, how do you prepare developers for the distributed world? If you do OSGI, you have to think about things come and go at any time. Uh, uh, when, whether you design on a single laptop or in a distributed environment. With Java standard approaches and JPMS and, uh, included, you teach people that the state is once defined, never change. And that is totally a different way of thinking about things. It's not about that technology or other technology. It's about wh how do you perceive things. And if you have static mind, then you go into the distributed world, it's much harder for you than if you think distributed from day one, even though you implement on the same machine. I think we're out of time, right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, um, I'll move to the uh, discussion area. Sure, uh, sure. So you can come and talk to me guys, there. Guys, if you have questions, Thank feel you free to ask. Thank you. The next result.